horribly abused since a baby. My, it all started out with my mother in witchcraft and whatever she did. She was so abusive, they photographed 20 cigarette burns on my body, five on my face. By the time I was like nine years old, I had 27 fractures on my skull from getting my head stomped in. They tried to drown me, whatever, whatever. Been the foster care. By the time I was 13 years old, I was doing armed robberies and in prison at 13. And uh, the prison system, when my sentence came up, I've never gotten a letter, not one visit, not one phone call. I have 13 uncles and aunties, a grandpa and a grandma, a mom and dad, and I got uh, two, three, four brothers, two sisters, not one visit, not one letter, not even in court. And uh, so I became very angry. I went to a few churches. They all treated me like I was a dirty. I was, I, you reminded me, I was looking at you thinking, man, like when I was your age, I was homeless on the streets. And uh, I'd come into a church looking for help, and people would be scared of me. They'd be like, oh, you better get away from us and our baby. You might hurt our baby. And it was really bad. So I said, screw that Christian stuff. They're a bunch of losers. They all think I'm going to hurt their baby, and all I want to do is go to church and get prayer, you know? So I became a criminal, and uh, I became a criminal fast, and I became very violent. By the time I was 18 years old, I was being investigated by the RCMP for not homicide times one, but times two. I've uh, kidnapped people, I've carjacked people, I've uh, hospitalized a police officer in a street fight, and the stories go on about me. I uh, got so sick of my life. Six years ago, I took a serious attempt on killing myself. I was in the hospital for three days, not caring. I didn't care about myself or anything. I thought I wasn't cared about. And uh, Jesus came to me in the prison cell, in the hospital bed. And uh, they, I was, they brought me to BC in the mission hospital here. And I had guards around me 24 hours a day with guns and stuff. And on Christmas day, I was handcuffed and shackled to a bed with guards with guns and one had a machine gun and handguns and handcuffs and radios and they were all surrounding me in the hospital. It was really embarrassing. And they made me eat coal on Christmas day. And I said, I, I started joking around. I said, wow, I must have been a real bad boy because, you know, not only did I get a lump of coal on Christmas, but I got to eat it. But it was really to pump up my stomach, they said, but it was pretty bad. And uh, then they took me to some mental assignment, asylum place and they, they put me on observations in there and then they released me to a homeless shelter once my release date came in federal prison clothes with a black with a black prison bag with a garbage bag with more prison clothes in it with my name on it so i was staying in a homeless shelter walking out desperate for to live a new life walking in these it had my name on my shirt and then i had to rip it off but you could see the cops were doing u-turns and coming up to me and pulling me over and iding me that i just escaped and i'm like i'm sure you hear it in the news if i just escaped Oh, how do we know what the prison doesn't know yet? I was going to construction sites. Uh, I was being treated like garbage. I was being lied about. I was getting 12 bucks an hour. I was, I, I, it was so pathetic that I had no money and I had no help that I was drinking water out of my hard hat because everybody here on the construction site, they were all like, ew, you're gross. And so again, I almost gave up on Jesus, but then he just said, don't give up yet and I'll make miracles happen. And uh, someone said, what do you want to do? And I said, I want to go to school, but no one's going to let me in with a grade six education because I'm legally defined as a grade six education by law if we went to court. That's what they would accept. So there would be nothing else because that's the truth. Suddenly I'm in BCIT and uh, I own a business and my life has gotten a whole heck of a lot better. Uh, alcohol has been removed, cigarettes, soap, all those horrible desires, all those horrible demons, all those things are all somehow gone. And I just didn't give up, and I just kept saying, nope, Jesus loves me, Jesus loves me, Jesus loves me, even if you don't or you don't, that doesn't matter. Jesus does, that's what matters. Even if I don't love me, he loves me, and that's where it all started. And now I am uh, coming along so far that I can't even believe the power of God. I had no clue, I had no idea. I thought it was all for you guys only, and I was the one guy that couldn't be forgiven because I did blasphemy or whatever. And that's what I truly, truly believed. And even recently, I'd walked into a church looking for friends, and uh, one of the churches in Surrey asked me for a criminal record check. So I said, how about I just, you know, like, leave, you know, and go somewhere else. Like, what do you mean a criminal record check? Well, how do we know you're not a dangerous criminal? And that was the pastor that was doing that. I said, and I, and he, I confronted him, and I said, you're the dangerous criminal, because I'm supposed to be coming in here and you're supposed to be preaching to me. You're not supposed to be doing a background check. You're supposed, you should already know my background. You should already know I'm a sinner and I'm lost and that you need to preach the gospel to me. And then he got mad and kicked me out of the church and I kind of said, kind of like the scripture said you would do. 
and they didn't like that. Because they're sick and tired of fake Christians, a bunch of Christians that hug each other, and they all think they're warm, and when some of these people die, they end up in hell. And they really didn't know that they weren't a Christian. They just, you know, Christianity is not just believing and you receive Christianity, you're walking with Jesus, man. It's not easy. That guy's not joking around because if Jesus was joking around, my five-year-old cousin wouldn't have got raped, killed, and murdered by Clifford Slay. You know, if God was joking around, your grandma wouldn't have died. If God was joking around, you'd have no problem. If God was just kidding, you ain't just kidding, man. People are dying and it's real. And the other scary thing about God is people are getting lit on fire for eternity. But God showed me there's a reason for that because I called God sick. I said, you're sick. You don't light someone on fire, you create someone with prong, you don't let them on fire for eternity, you sick of us calling them all kinds of names. And then he showed me that because it's with free will. With free will, when you make that final decision that I'm going to love God, it doesn't matter if it's weak, as long as it's final. And that's your decision that you're going to love God, the scripture says you'll get brighter and brighter and better and better and better. Same thing with wicked people, when they make that final decision, it might take them 500 years to get more black, but as eternity goes on, they're going to get worse and worse and worse if they were allowed to live on earth with free will. And that's why God created a hellfire, because it's an eternal decision. So you want your own kingdom away from God? Fine, here it is. And it's, 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 we're imperfect, we bleed, we stink, we die, we get sick, and we think we don't need God. And we think we can fight God, but you wouldn't even step in the yard with vicious pit bulls. But then guys go around saying, oh, I can fight God, bro, oh, I'd like to see. But yet we won't even fight a pit bull. We're scared it's going to hurt us. Or we're scared of COVID, but nobody's scared of God. Got some, these people got some issues. God's the one that allowed the COVID to be released. It doesn't matter if the Illuminati released it and it's a man-made thing that was released in from a factory. None of that matters. What matters is God allowed it, so God's in control of that. People aren't fearing him. And I, I, I guess I'm more preaching than giving a testimony, but statistically <coughs> speaking, I was walking around with loaded guns. I was the guy that would have shot you when you were telling your testimony. I was that guy, and I wouldn't have cared about your life at all because I did not care about mine, because nobody else cared about mine that I knew about at the time. And when you're raised that way, my father's a full patch biker. I have nothing to do with him. My brother's a full patch biker. I have nothing to do with him. My mother's, I don't even want to get into her. She's gone. And uh, I got no family, no support. My brother won't talk to me because I believe in Jesus. So and his, I'm not allowed around his kids in case I hurt one of them because I'm a Christian and I might be like those Catholics that hurt kids. My brother wants nothing to do with me. But I was reading the Bible and they said that when you lose your mothers and brothers for my sake, you're worthy. Amen. Mm -hmm. and it hurts. I live with hurt every single day. Every single day of my life, I live with hurt, even though things are getting better. And uh, my only strength is Jesus because uh, there is no other way. You know, like I, I don't know what else I got. You know, like I, I was kind of telling him, I was wondering if people wanted to ask me questions that would help me. Yeah. Answer my testimony better and how I came to Jesus. Like, here, put it this way. In the name of Jesus, when I was a drug dealer carrying a gun, going around being cruel and robbing other people and all this other stuff and all that lifestyle and all whatever, I, I had no life for God. I was involved in prostitution, not doing it. I was, you know, seeing proof that we got money. I was involved in providing women with drugs and men with drugs. I was involved with robbing drug dealers and almost killing some of them and others were getting killed and the list goes on. And one day, while I was living in that lifestyle, my friend came and told me he thinks his mom's a witch. And I laughed at him. I said, dude, lay off the drugs, bro. And every day he was banging on my door. And one morning he was sweating so bad. So I said, fine, let's, let's, let's go. I actually almost shot him through the door because I thought he was some criminal coming to get me. I saw him banging on my door and he almost got shot. And that's a true story. <laughs> So anyways, that's how bad I was living. I was not living for Jesus is what my point is, but here's what you're going to hear. He took me to his house, and he's telling me she's trying to poison me. The walls are painted white, but they're black, like the cat's demon possessed. I thought, oh, he was sweating. I thought, oh, you don't care drugs you're on. He said, oh, no, 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 look at how bad you're sweating. He's looking scared. So I went down to this house, and I was mocking him. Mmm, I was eating these mashed potatoes. He said, we're poisoned. Mmm, those are some yummy mashed poison, I said, uh, yummy mashed poisoned potatoes. Told me that he was trying to stop me from drinking the juice. I, pushed, I was chugging his juice, it was spilling everywhere. He swore it was poison. I laughed at him. 
And then he watched me and then nothing happened and I went home and nothing happened. And the next day he's at my house banging on my door, am I alive? Then one day, something said, go to your friend's house and just walk in without knocking and go upstairs. And I didn't know anything about God. I just thought that was my own feelings to do that. So I went down to this house and I went in there thinking I was going to surprise him, catching them having sex with this, this stepmom of his or something weird. And I went in there and I went upstairs and I was really quiet. And I was just about to knock on, on the stepmom's door. She opened the door and she said, hello, man of God. Just like I was Isaiah or whatever. Call me man of God. What are you talking about, man of God? I'm a gangster. I'm a drug dealer. I'm the one that's responsible for half the shootings and deaths around here. What are you talking about, man of God? And I looked in her room and she had candles, a skull burning. She was doing witchcraft. She had a Ouija board out. And she told me that her Ouija board was telling her that I was coming. I'm getting to the name of Jesus here when I was a criminal, how powerful it is. And her Ouija board was there. She was doing all this witchcraft. I don't know if I seen this in the movie or what, but I said, you got to throw all that in the garbage. You're going to hell. And here I am. <laughs> here I am on my way to hell. Maybe I'm not telling her she's going to hell, you know? So she's like, I don't want to go to hell. And I was like, neither do I. So then we cleaned up this witchcraft stuff right then and there. My friend couldn't believe it. Brought it downstairs. We started praying to God. I don't even knew, know what we prayed or what we... I don't have no memory of it. I just remember we prayed to God about something about it, to give her or something. And then uh, I came back again, my friend was shocked. We, we were still living that lifestyle, I was still drinking. I came over one day to get ready for a party. And along comes this cat. Oh, there's the devil, kitty, I said. Here, kitty, kitty. All of a sudden, all of our hair stood up. Your, whoever was in the house, your hair stood up. Your, even, the, even that lady's like, my eyebrow hair was standing up. This cat had a devil in it. it everything was normal, and it got a certain distance to me. Something, I now know it was the Holy Spirit, made me jump up on the seat like a woman that saw a mouse. And I pointed at that cat, and no one has ever caught me this, and I've never even been to church. And I said, I even used the words rebuke. I said, I rebuke you in the name of Jesus. And this cat started flopping and flipping it, bent in half, and it looked like a fish out of water flopping on the ground. And it let out this really loud... Oh, that was so loud. <laughs> this mother of the witchcraft lady witnessed it. I witnessed it. My friend's girlfriend witnessed it. And he witnessed it. Well, I'll tell you this much. Our party got canceled that yeah. night. <laughs> and I thought, oh, I'm so powerful, I thought. You see that, guys? And then it freaked us all out. We actually stopped being friends. And then I continued in that lifestyle of violence and crime. Nothing changed for me. And I actually got worse. And then... Uh, 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 my point was, was I ran into my friend and then those, that lady's a Christian and then he went away. But my point is, is I wasn't even living for Jesus or owned the Bible or going to church. And I, as a sinful human being, was able to take up the name of Jesus and rebuke a demon. That's how powerful the name of Jesus is. And that's why Jesus says, some people, I'm going to say, I never knew you. Get away from me, evildoer. I never knew you. Oh, but Lord, we kicked out demons in your name. Yeah, exactly. My name. They thought they were Christians. And I learned that lesson that I, that just because if I could take up the name of Jesus and kick a demon out of a cat that I didn't even know was demon possessed and I ain't praying or preaching or reading or anything. And that happened in front of us and I got witnesses to back up my story and even they're freaked out. That, that was the day that I started believing in Jesus. But I didn't follow him. And I didn't know how I knew all that, but I started, but that's the day that I could never stop. It was too powerful because all of our, and I jumped up and I said, in the name of Jesus, and that cat flipped and flopped and let out a roar. Just like the Bible says, people fell down and the spirit let, let out a loud scream before coming out and did not injure the man. And my friend reported to me that when that cat came back, the very next day, it was actually like three weeks, he uh, was a normal cat and he was telling me that before when he was paranoid, he was explaining this cat would purr on him one minute and it would turn and tear the heck out of his face and it would hide behind the couch growling for three hours. For like three hours straight. And then I apologized to him. I said, I'm so sorry. And that I'm pretty sure that whole house got saved. Even the cat. <laughs> <laughs> and then and, 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 and that was a true story. And then I continued in my lifestyle and I became very, very dangerous. I became very violent. I'm, I was very well known in Edmonton. And then God cleaned up my life so much that those other gangsters that see me now, 
they don't they don't bother me and they want me to preach to them. They want to hear what happened to me because they were terrified of me. Even gang even like gang leaders were scared of me because in my mind I had nothing to lose and I just didn't care. So I was gonna if you were gonna threaten me with five gang guys and your knives and swords, well I'll come by myself and I will shoot you by myself without a friend. That's how messed up I was. And now I'm so on the right path with Jesus that doctors think that you're doing so well and they will not prescribe me medication. They refuse. Psychiatrists who get paid to prescribe me medication are refusing to prescribe me medication saying I don't need it. That's how far the Lord has brought me through my healing. And now I own a legitimate business and I'm legitimately licensed and I somehow got a PCIT with grade 6 education. And, and, and as far as they're concerned, I was, uh, aside from what I told you, as far as they were concerned, all the other instructors, is I, I was an outstanding student and I got a 95% average. Mm -hmm. and so, and now, huh? Yeah, can you tell about the prison guards or the, was it the prison oh, guards? Prison the prison guards guys quit, quit their jobs, a counselor quit his job because of me, now he's doing street, he was never, he was an atheist, and now he's out there doing street preaching after yeah, meeting me. Right because statistically speaking, with how much abuse I received and how badly I was starved and beat and used and abused, with I served 10 years in prison without any visits. Uh, I was fighting with guards and inmates. I almost killed an inmate one time. They caught me red-handed and he was turning purple. I mean, he was, all, he was dying and that was my plan. And uh, cause you're in jail doing, you know, no one cares about you. It's jail, it's devils, and it's, that's how it is. And a uh, guard caught me red-handed and happened to grab me and pull me off him. And now the guy could suddenly started breathing because I was choking him out. What was the defining moment, though? It was when I was in the hospital. When I was in the hospital bed after Christmas Day, it would have been uh, maybe Boxing Day or something. I was laying in this hospital bed inside a prison, staring at the roof, and the whole room just lit up with some kind of light. And then I heard something in my heart telling me that you are loved. And then uh, there, it was telling me there are no aliens. Aliens are demons masquerading as aliens. And this voice just spoke to me for hours about my life. And it cleared up a lot of questions I had. And it gave me a miraculous power. And I even felt demons leave my body. I felt them leave my body. People can be demon possessed and live a normal lifestyle. People think demon possession is, ah, and you're going to crawl up the wall. That's Hollywood hype. That's all bull crap. Demon possession is demons need a home to live in. And it doesn't mean Christians are going to hell if they're demon possessed, but they're not going to have a very good Christian life. It could mean that. I'm not God. But, uh, yeah, my point is, is I felt them come out of me. And I'm not sure who was praying for me. But that's just the power of just believing in Jesus and just using his name and just reading the Bible alone right. made demons come out of me. Right mm -hmm. So you're reading the Bible in the hospital then? Or? Yeah, they, I actually, uh, well, because when you do that, they, they'll bring in native workers if you're native. Yeah. If that doesn't work, then they'll say, are you a Muslim? They'll bring in a Muslim guy. If you're a Christian, they'll bring in a Christian guy. And it, I, I identified as like, well, you know, I'm Canadian, so I guess I'm Christian. And then so they brought in the pastor who started bringing me Bibles. And I was using, sorry to say this, the Bible is toilet paper. <laughs> I was angry still. I was tell I was, and then the pastor would come over and say, "How's how's your Bible reading going? You need another Bible?" And I was purposely acting like I lost it, but in my mind, I'm like, "I'm going to destroy as many Bibles as I can to hurt God, get them back." And the sh so these prisoners can't know God. If I'm so suffering, they're going to suffer with me. Oh, that why I think that guy had a hutch full of Bibles because. He brought me about 20, 30 Bibles, and he named it. He goes, this is 30 or 20-something Bibles, and what are you doing with them? Because these Bibles need that. And I told him the truth, and then he still brought me Bibles. <laughs> and, then that, and then that showed me that God valued me so much that he wasn't playing legalistic judge in heaven. He was playing father. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that's what God was doing. And all he was doing was writing on a piece of paper, some ink on a paper, and reissuing me the letter that I love you. And that's what he was doing. And once I saw the power of God's love, that in the hospital room there, around all that time when I was doing that, then I started, so, suddenly just clicked out of nowhere, and I said, fine. If you love me, then fine. Prove it more. You know, and I didn't realize he would prove it more. I just thought I was being selfish. And I thought it was even selfish to say that. 
So now uh, people meet me. A Buddhist recently gave her life to Jesus. Uh, a Hindu converted because of me, but I had to make him cry first. Uh, a counselor quit his job, and he was an atheist. Now him is doing street preaching. A judge quit his job. A police officer gave his life to Jesus while I was in handcuffs. After hearing some of my stories, after you know I was in handcuffs and I had a cop escorting me back to the prison, and uh, oh. Let me tell you about my experiences in this hospital here. With the Holy Spirit coming in my room. And, and he bowed his head and he started praying to Jesus as I was in handcuffs. It's like, this crazy. So I know the power of Jesus is real.